had my days in the underworld there with uh, smuggling marijuana. Uh, you know, so I've, I've been deemed uh, the king of weed, one of the identities that I took on. It was depicted on that show, Locked Up Abroad. It's the biggest mental health and addiction crisis that the world's ever seen that we know of. I can be an advocate in any way. I solemnly swear that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Hey everybody, Ron here from The Truth About Addiction. Today's guest is Ryan Phillips. Ryan's speaking to us out of Thailand, but Ryan's not from Thailand. Ryan's from Canada, aren't you? Is that correct? I sure am. Uh, born and raised in North Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, and I'm actually very blessed. I'm at uh, uh, it's a mental health uh, treatment facility uh, for trauma, anything to do with mental health and addiction. Uh, it's, it's a great facility. Actually, they have a 85 uh, plus percent rate with success with people coming in here and uh, doing a lot of uh, neurofeedback and whatnot. And uh, yeah, so I'm actually going to be doing uh, uh, some unresolved trauma work of my own while I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm quite blessed. And uh, yeah, the, the staff here are incredible, awesome facility. Uh, nothing like back home, that's for sure. <laughs> Warm. <laughs> back home, there's a lot of snow right now. So uh, I'm one of the lucky ones. Yeah, I, I don't like cold, man. I'm, <clears throat> I'm not a big fan of the cold. Well, this is my 38th time over to Southeast Asia. And so I, I realize now why almost every year during the winter, I would uh, yeah. uh, geographically relocate over to the, over to Southeast Asia. I, I love this part of the world. So it's great. Yeah. Land of skills and, uh, you know, healthy food and just, uh, it's just really good energy for sure. What part of Thailand is it in? I'm in Chiang Mai right now yeah, yeah that's the place to be Chiang Mai yeah actually I, I've been at Ch Ch Chiang Mai well I got my humanitarian pardon after uh you know I had my days in the underworld there with uh, smuggling marijuana uh you know so I, I've been deemed uh, the king of weed one of the identities that I took on uh, with my ego centered uh, crap personality back in the day and uh you know after I escaped uh, that business by the skin of my teeth. Um, that was all, a lot of it was depicted on that show, Locked Up Abroad with National Geographic. Um, yeah, in 2012, I was really blessed enough to get introduced to um, the evil epidemic, which is child sex slavery. And I rode across Cambodia for that purpose. And after, the day after the ride, the Department of Homeland Security found out that one of Canada's uh, biggest marijuana smugglers, uh, you know, went across uh, Cambodia and helped with kids. And uh, I was able to get a, you know, a, as a humanitarian waiver to, as a free man to be able to go back to the United States again. So something that, you know, I was, that was zero zilch chance. I was supposed to never be allowed back there, but uh, by the grace of God and um, the cosmos, the universe, Jesus yeah. Christ, they call it, uh, you know, I was very blessed. So yeah, they told me not to reapply. I lived in America for many years. I've got a half American daughter. Oh, no way. I never committed a crime the whole time I was there. 20 years I was in and out of America. Never committed a crime. I was in recovery the whole time I was in America. And, really? um, yeah. And then what happened was, uh, if you know my story, I got arrested in 2002, went back to prison for eight years into a maximum security prison, got out of prison. My daughter was still living in America in high school. I put an application to go and visit my daughter and they said, no way, don't ever apply again. So my daughter moved back to Australia. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, you know. Yeah, but, my daughter is right now. She's uh, she's in a treatment center right now for drug addiction. Um, she's 24. And, yeah, she's the love of my life. I'm hoping actually to get her over here into this facility because her, you know, she's been through a lot of trauma herself in her life. She got into the gang life at, uh, you know, as an early teen and into the meth and all kinds of other junk. And, uh, man, it's just been uh, it's been really, really uh, challenging over the past year, you know, trying to get her well again. So, um, yeah, it's uh, she's in the States. I'm in Thailand and we're doing our best to get over here and uh, get her. You know, environment is, is everything really, truly. We know that community, um, my friend, community. Absolutely. So, you know, she's, she's got a fighting chance. Um, she's, you know, and she's really willing this time. Um, 
like uh, she's a cat with 9,000 lives, this kid. I, I mean, I don't know how she's made it this far. She's like your old man, I guess. I was going to say, she's got a bit of your blood. Yeah, she's been in that. She's actually been in the psych board 43 times, tried to take her life four times. And, you know, so we really, uh, you know, I'm just, I, I pray every day that, uh, you know, things are going to turn around and, uh, you know, she gets the right help she needs. And, you know, the, the redemption plan will be uh, put into effect uh, under divine order. <laughs> Don't give up hope. I have a daughter who's 16 years sober. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. And she runs a detox clinic. Really? She's oh, a nurse good. and she runs a detox, private detox clinic in Australia. Oh, how cool is that? Yeah, no, she's good. 42 this year. And she's that's 17 years clean. Yeah, it's nice. And you got 40 years of sobriety under your belt? No, I've got 38. Yeah, on, the yeah. third of, on the third of the third, I'm 38 years clean and sober. I got, oh, wow. I got sober in um, 1981 first. And then I, I, I had three goes. I had 10 months, 12 months, then 30 months. But I I did it my way. I did the Frank Sinatra way, you know. Well, I'm actually looking for a new sponsor, so maybe I'll hit you. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> but um, yeah, our stories are very similar, you know. As you know, I think you know I was born into a life of crime. That's yep. that's that's a banner behind me. Born into the lie of crime. I've changed the. I took the F out of it. I was born into the lie of crime, not the life. There was no life in it. No. And uh, my dad was a gangster. I mean. Real gangster, I'm not talking about, you know, where I grew up, you catch and killed your own. You didn't leave dead people on the streets. They all went away. And the cops even told us, you leave people on the streets, then we have to get involved. You, you clean the oven up, we don't care, you know, because we're killing each other. We're gangsters killing each other. Like that. And that's exactly what I was involved with, too. It was, yeah. uh, you know, just, just the fact that I was able, you know, I was running a crew on both sides of the border, on the Canadian side and the U.S. side, I never sold weed in Canada. It always it went down south, and I got yeah. it was right, at the you know what they call the B.C. marijuana bud boom, and you know it was the mid '90s. I just you know I was uh, you know crime uh, ran in my family as well. My my great grandmother actually she lived to be 108, and she was involved with the Russian mafia during the Prohibition days. You know, and uh, liquor with her husband who was from Russia as well over the border. So it. I don't know. I mean, it, it was, you know, when hockey didn't work out for me, you know, I was devastated. I was a really high prospect and, you know, to make it to, you know, to the NHL. I did play professionally, but I didn't make it to the highest rank due to concussions, injuries, and definitely my drinking habits uh, didn't uh, benefit me. Uh, as far, I was blackballed in that industry, in the, in the, in the, in, it's an industry, you know, the, the, the number on the back of your jersey is like a dollar sign. If you're not performing, yeah. you know, they, they ship you out as fast as uh, they, they sign you in. So, um, but yeah, it's, you know, you know, one of my main messages these days, especially to kids and to anybody that, you know, um, has that preconceived notion that crime pays. Well, there's three realities that we both know. You either end up with an addiction, you either mm -hmm. end up dead or in prison. And, uh, you know, by the God, uh, I went to prison. Um, when I got out, I, I didn't become a good boy right away. It was like going to, it was like college for criminals. Yeah. And ramped it up again, even bigger. And I uh, went on for a few years. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's so, you know how it is when you're in it and when you're running it, you know, getting out of it, you know, people are depending on you. And, you know, it's not small amounts of cash you're dealing with and you're dealing with millions of dollars a week. And it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's not even about the money. It's just, uh, it, it's, it's a dangerous game and people have become dependent on you and they all need to eat and they're eating off your plate. And it's just, uh, I mean, you know how it is. And then you got murders going around you and overdoses. And um, I mean, God, when I, when I really look back on it, you know, I believe that all addiction really stems from trauma. And, um, you know, all the traumatic experiences, uh, you know, I experienced even in the hockey culture, which has, you know, got a lot of uh, publicity lately, especially in Canada and the U.S., um, you know, initiations, uh, bullying, all that kind of stuff, sexual acts, um, that really, you know, set the precedence um, for myself for, you know, the drinking, you know, the painkillers, which led into the, you know, the cocaine, the MDMA, the, the anything under the sun, barn loads of everything. Right. Yeah. So, but, um, you know, I went to my first AA meeting when I was 27 and I, you know, I didn't get it right away. 
<laughs> I mean, it was a, it was an old timers uh, meeting. I was uh, like a kid that went in there and they asked me to, to share. And I thought I had to share my whole story. So after rambling for about 20 minutes, they said, you only have five minutes. I was like, okay. they're a little bit intrigued saying you should have been in here about maybe 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Hundred percent. I got. That's really funny. I got clean when I was twenty-seven. Really? Yeah. yeah. I, a lot of people, man. A lot. You know, I didn't stay clean the same as you. I fit or asked around for five years, but a lot of people seem to hit the rock bottom at twenty-seven years of age. I don't know what it is, but I've never done statistics on it because I'm not a statistic person. I'm a result-driven person. Yeah. I don't care well, if numbers. I am a bit of a statistic person and, you know, uh, even with the suicides these days with the mental health crisis, 87% of the suicides are men, yeah. which is, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, you know, quite sad. I've lost a, a lot of, you know, close acquaintances in the last few years due to suicide. Um, uh, even, you know, with the rehab facilities, you know, over in North America, you know, the, the success, success rate, it's like, you know, five to 8%. Yeah. Um, I actually was just in a wellness center. Um, I haven't drank in seven and a half years. Um, but my good old doctor actually prescribed me, uh, benzodiazepams and told me they were good for my anxiety and all that kind of stuff. I had no idea, no clue that they were highly addictive. So I, I had a bit of an issue abusing those pills and some sleeping pills as well. Um, and I was tapering myself in and off those things. And I mean, the withdrawals off that is just brutal. You can um, die. I'm actually right now I'm at, uh, right about 0.5 of, of, uh, two milligram tablet. And, uh, you know, I'm just slowly, but surely coming off it. But it's funny cause I, I well, it's not funny, but when I was going to a, a lot of AA meetings back in Canada, uh, I would be very open about it. I was like, you know, I've, I'm taking benzodiazepams, you know, clomazepam and this and that. Next thing you know, you know, 75% of the room is putting their hands. Oh, yeah, me too. Oh, yeah, me too. Yeah, oh, yeah, me too. But, um, you know, there's a huge benzo uh, epidemic in the United States alone. Uh, last year, there was over 50 million benzo prescriptions that were handed out. And they're putting benzos and fentanyl. They're putting it in everything. It's just brutal. Um, and actually... Before I went into this facility for 60 days, I was in Dallas, Texas, filming a movie. Uh, it's actually going to be released uh, later this year called Radical Forgiveness. And it actually intertwines my journey of uh, um, way beyond what was put on National Geographic as the king of weed, because that's so in the past. Um, you know, I talk about it in my own words, my journey in mental health, the, the hockey culture, um, addiction. Uh, the benzo pharma, 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 you know, pharmaceuticals, that whole deal. So it's going to open up a whole can of worms, but it, uh, it's, it's a trauma to faith based film. And um, after that was shot, I couldn't sleep for two days. And uh, I, I got an offer to go to this wellness center in British Columbia, Canada. And I was like, yeah, I, I think I'm going to take, the, take you guys up on the offer. <laughs> so after I did that, I asked, I prayed, uh, prayed to God. I said, uh, God, where do you want me now? And the very next day, I got a phone call from my buddy here in Thailand that I met six years ago. And he said, oh, I got this, uh, I'm working at this treatment center called the Treehouse. And it's all about, for mental health and trauma and yada, yada, yada. And I was like, oh, my God, God answered my prayers. So, uh, so here I am. I'm not staying here at the facility, but uh, I'll definitely be getting some, you know, work done here with trauma and neurofeedback and all that kind of stuff. ED EMDR. I've had and, it. I've had it. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and especially for, you know, I get the, the, the nightmares and the flashbacks and all that kind of stuff. I don't sleep a whole lot. Um, a lot of it due to, you know, a lot of the, the abuse, but I think more the, the organized crime aspect of my life, you know, looking back being like, holy geez, like, I can't believe I was. I took on that identity of a gangster, you know, yeah. when I look in, uh, you know, yeah, I got the tattoos and all that kind of stuff, whatever. But I mean, <laughs> I just, I can't believe I was that person, you know, for a while. And so there's been a lot of radical forgiveness that's needed to take place in my own life saying, you know, I'm not that person. I wasn't that person and being able to forgive myself for some of the stuff that I did in that, in that world. And uh, you know, especially what I put my parents through, you know, not only did I put my parents through, my active addiction, you know, when I was in it, 
But, you know, I put the, you know, doing two years in a maximum federal uh, penitentiary without seeing the light of day. Um, you know, I just, you know, I, I put my parents through a lot, my family. And, you know, so you carry carrying that shame and guilt is, isn't exactly the easiest thing in the world. So that's why I'm very passionate about mental health and yeah. uh, obviously led to me uh, riding my bicycle across four countries in 2019 before COVID. I was going to do the world, um, but I just wanted to bring as much awareness to mental health as possible to help, you know, rid the stigma. And I think it's getting a little bit better. Um, you know, trauma is like the catchphrase of the world these days, I think, you know, because we're also universally as attached spiritually, which is a good thing, too, you know, but uh, I think everybody's nervous systems are hyper aware, hyper uh, throttled. <laughs> so, Yeah, and I, I'm an old guy. I'm, I'm nearly 70. And um, my wife's only 34 and my, I've got an eight year old and a four year old. Wow. 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 Yeah. Right on. So, you know, um but just for, just for the record, everybody talks about, you know, recovery, 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 you know, and people have seemed to think that there's only one way to get clean. It's not no. true. No, I agree with you on that. As Absolutely. long as it works for you, and I even like harm minimization. you know, I believe the pharmaceutical companies of the world are the biggest drug dealers in the world. They make us look like babies. Oh, God. Seriously. <laughs> Once this film gets released, I'm going to have a bounty on my head. <laughs> it's a, uh, pretty deep into it. I'll, I'll, I'll show you the, uh, I'll send you the rough trailer maybe after the interview. Yeah. We have uh, that are editing the film. He actually, the editor's from uh, Lord of the Rings and Star Wars. So okay, cool. um, people on board that are going to put this together where the whole world can see this. Um, you know, that apparently that National Geographic episode was watched by, um, you know, 500 million or something like that. And this is the real, this is my testimony. And, um, you know, so we're, we're opening up a huge can of worms when it comes to human trafficking, mental health, addiction, and pharmaceuticals, which has been a huge theme in my life is like, uh, you know, misdiagnosed with bipolar later to find out it was post concussions. And, you know, so when we talk about recovery, you know, there's so many, you know, uh, there's so many modalities yeah. when, you, when you recovery. Yes, there's the 12 steps. But, you know, for me, the most important one was, you know, turning my wife, my life and my will over to the care of a God of my understanding and let him drive the bus, not me. Yeah. You know, yeah. The self centric uh, asshole that, uh, you know, burned his life to the ground <laughs> and everybody else is uh, around me for, <laughs> emotionally, for that, at least. <laughs> The nice well, thing about recovery is that the disease of addiction, which I believe the word disease, you know, um, okay, I wasn't comfortable with myself, so I wasn't at ease, so I was diseased. But I believe I had an affliction. An affliction yeah. is meant to cause harm. And I wanted to cause harm to myself no matter what, whether it was through crime, whether it was through bad relationships, whether it was through infidelity, whether it was through drugs, whether it was through alcohol, whether it was just through risk-taking. That's why I know in my heart of hearts I was always an addict long before I picked up a drug. Oh, God, yeah. Me too. Absolutely. I just I think really at the end of the day I, had a, I, was, I, I was always a people pleaser. I had a penchant to please. I was a mama's boy pretty much. Yeah. And when I accepted in that hockey world, you know, I left home at 16 and was like thrown out to the wolves. I lived in almost 20 homes by the, from the time I was 16 to 22 years old or something like that. And I mean, it was just, I, I, I just wanted to be loved and I was willing to go to any lengths to get it. And for, a lot of, for a lot of the people in Australia, they haven't seen ice hockey. <laughs> they don't understand. See, we have a game called NRL, Rugby League, which is yes. a really violent game. But I've seen ice hockey in, yeah. in America Man, it's next level violent too. It's a violent game. Well, none of these are real. These yeah. are all fake. This yeah. nose right that can push over to the side has yeah. been broken ten times. I've had have had over forty five plus bones broken, ribs and elbows, cracked knees and broken bo every bone in my hands. And I mean, I I fought a little bit. 
Um, but not as much as like, you know, that there's back in the, that when I played, there was enforcers on the team and there still kind of is, but I mean, I truly, I, I wish for the game of hockey that fighting would be taken out of the game because it's barbaric. It really is. The fans love it, but at the end of the concussions that are being, uh, you know, sustained by a lot of these players, just like rugby, just like, you know, football, um, you know, and I've had 20 plus concussions in my life. And, you know, the CTE that people talk about, um, I mean, I have all those symptoms. When I wake up in the morning, I feel like I got hit by a bus. And a lot of that is why I actually turned to painkillers and stuff like that was because I was suffering from migraines, vertigo, um, just, you know, loss of speech, uh, all that kind of stuff, short memory loss. And, um, I mean, I'm very blessed that, you know, there's parts of my brain that still work very well or else we wouldn't be talking right now. Yeah. Uh, if I wasn't in recovery, I mean, I'd be dead, you know, a hundred percent, you know? Um, yeah. It's, uh, I would never, I love the game of hockey. Um, I, 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 you know, it was, it was my dream my whole life, but I wouldn't put a child into the game of hockey now to take that child to the next level because you know, the injuries that these kids, because they're just kids now that play in, in the yeah. NHL, the average age is 25. It's the collateral damage after the career is done, you know, and your lifespan and, you know, playing pro sports, you know, yeah, you're going to make big money for the first few years or whatever and sign these big contracts, but half these guys spend most of their money unless they're smart and put some away into real estate or good investments. But, uh, you know, a lot of these guys that uh, had long careers, you know, they're uh, they're in debt. And not, not only they they're not only are they in debt, they uh, have you know chronic injuries and pain and stuff from the past. It's it's fun until the party's over. It, it, the fast lane, you know. Until you get to seventy years of age, brother. I feel like I'm like two hundred right now. <laughs> yeah, I remember the doctor told me about twenty five years ago. Um, I used to be a boxer okay. that I had the I had the neck of a, a seventy year old. That was about 30 years ago. So I'd like to get, I, I don't want to get it. I've already had spinal fusions and all that oh. stuff because all the, you're not supposed to get punched in the head. No. You got a little neck like that and you got a bowling ball sitting on top of it. And the doctor explained to me, you know, even in sparring, you got a mouth guard and you got a head gear on, but you're still getting all this impact in your head. He said, yeah, we're not meant to be like that, you know, the crashing and, okay, let's get back to the addiction. You started yeah. using pot. I started using pot when I was 16. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, I, I left home, like I said, uh, to go pursue my hockey career and to fit in. Uh, drinking was, it was, you know, hockey and drinking went hand in hand. And, you know, the younger players were initiated by the older players and, and we were forced to drink. And, you know, right off the bat, you know, I, I, there was an allergy. And I had no idea that, you know, I always thought of an alcoholic as the guy that was on the side of the, you know, the homeless guy with a paper bag. And, um, but it quickly, you know, I, I, it made me, it opened me up. I was a real, like kind of a, sh a shy guy. Uh, you know, I didn't talk a whole lot, but once, you know, you got, had a few cold sociables into me one after another, I'd, uh, I'd be life of the party. And, uh, that's, you know, I kind of, I, I, my, my, my last name's Phillips. My next nickname's Philly and everyone called me good time Philly. Mm -hmm. and so, yeah. Um, yeah. My reputation from being a great hockey player turned into like the biggest uh, partier guy. Uh, yeah. in, the uh, fun guy. The fun guy. Yeah. I was never really a violent drunk or anything like that, but um, right now in these times, which I think is the biggest mental health and addiction crisis that the world's ever seen that we know of. Um, if I can be an advocate in any way in this spectrum, um, you know, I'll use my voice and my platform, you know, to do yeah. that. So, yeah. especially with a daughter as well, that's, you know, suffers from the, you know, from addiction, um, man, it's, uh, it's a doozy out there. <laughs> it's a doozy. Man, my whole purpose is to carry the message these days. Yep. Absolutely. I, I, do you still go to, do you go to a lot of meetings? I go to a meeting once a week. Well, we're having a meeting right now. Yeah, exactly. I go to a meeting once a week, but I talk to somebody in recovery every single day. Maybe a few people. I also run an online rehab program. It's 30 days. Every single day, you've got to talk to me for an hour on a face talk. 
and I teach you about the 12 steps of the 12 step programs, but my version. Ah, uh, I like to hear about that. Maybe, for, maybe the 42 years of my experience is the first step tells me that I can't take a drink or a drug and have a good life. Take away all the philosophical bullshit, right? All these 69 questions in the first step. My question is, can you guarantee behavior once you put a chemical in your body? No. Okay. First step done. You think you can use? Yes. You're fucking insane. Second step's done. When you're insane, what do you need to do? You need to talk to somebody who's saner than you. Yes, you hand your will and your life over to the care of me. Third step's done. Okay. Now, what trauma did you deal with? Let's do a life story. Oh, there's your cycles. Oh, look, there's your cycle. There's, I did one this morning with a guy, his life, his life story, and I gave him a list of five defects of character. Fear, people pleasing, guilt, self-worth. Yep. I hear people say, I had 63 defects of character. Piss off. Piss <laughs> off. No. Piss off. You know, that's just philosophical bullshit. That's the self-centered addict making himself grander than what he really is. 100%. You just yeah. nailed it. Thought. Nailed it. Keep, keep I, it simple, man. It took me a lot of years to actually like grasp this one, but the biggest one for me is fear. Yeah. Fear. It, it, everything comes down to fear with me. And it's, uh, you know, uh, fear, fear of hurting people, not even fear yeah. of hurting myself and people, places, and things for sure. Yeah. Fear. You know, as I, I get, I've gotten older, it's, you know, I, I do get, it's the trauma. It's, you know, I get triggered by like even my own city. You know, the city yep. where I, uh, you know, <laughs> the city where I was, you know, doing all my bad stuff, you know, I, I, I still, I, I go back to Vancouver and it's like, I, I feel like I got to wear a wig and glasses because I'm always looking over my shoulder thinking I'm going to get shot. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, that's, that's, that's reality. So there's a lot yeah. of stuff that has to be dealt with still, you know, that's why it's spiritual progress, not perfection. A hundred percent. I, I believe in fear is they say, fuck everything and run. Yeah. Or face everything and recover. I like that. And yeah. that whole hearing right, I don't believe that because a lot of times it is right. Yeah. <laughs> and what I try to tell people is I interviewed the, in New Zealand, we got a lot of gangs in New Zealand. And I went over there on the Sex Abuse Royal Commission trying to help the, the gangs yeah. to get a bit of justice. So um, I went over to the Royal Commission into abuse. You know, the gang members as children were given away, taken from their parents and given to other foster care in churches, and the churches abused them sexually. And all these guys coming out with really bad attitudes and drug addictions and alcoholism and fucking violence and all this sort of shit. And, like, I did a podcast with one of the founding members of the Black Power. He's from the 70s. He's one of the, the tough gangs. And yeah. he, 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 he's turned his life to Jesus Christ, you know, which is not I don't care what you call your higher power as long as it's not you. And he said to me, he said, um, brother, he said, all my life, I was a violent man. I was violent to my wife. I was violent to my children. I was violent to everybody who came near me. He said, because that's what I was. He said, everyone was violent to me. He said, my grandparents, my mother, my father, everyone was violent. He said, and I was full of fear because my dad would beat me up. And I was fearful that if, if I let you beat me up, they didn't want to beat me up. So I could never let you beat me up. Oh, blah, 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 blah. He said, and I, then I, I handed my life over to Jesus Christ. He said, and I realized that one day, he said, I was sitting in my lounge room. He said, and fear knocked on the front door. He said, I asked faith to answer it. He said, when he opened it, no one was there. He said, because fear and faith can't be in the same room together. Or bad fellows, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> and when he said that, it was like, yeah, you know, that was a really nice way of putting it. Yeah. Because I believe faith is the opposite to fear. And I'm a big believer in faith. Why, yeah, are we, why are we having this conversation today? Because something greater than us has put us together in circumstances there's no accidents, everything's synchronized, yeah. everything's finely guided, so to speak. And, you know, nothing happens in God's world by mistake. I really truly believe that, that like energy, acts like energy. Yeah. And, you know, like even, even our thoughts, you know, I, I believe that, you know, our thoughts, you know, like the, the brain, the human brain is a broadcasting and receiving station for the vibration of thought. Everybody's all into this manifestation thing these days. And, you know, um, but I truly believe that match the frequency, match the desire. And a lot of times, even, you know, a lot of addicts are, are so, so intelligent. And, you know, when they, when they clean up, the reason why they, they start getting their lives back and they can start building some, themselves up again is because they clean out the vessel, 
they become that physical instrument where they can actually attract into their life vibrationally whatever it is that they desire yeah. and able to do that you know a lot especially when i got clean the first time um and when i was clean even when i i manifested you know my pardon back down to the united states of america i mean i wrote it down on a paper and through the a principle called auto suggestion which is the medium for influencing the subconscious mind i read this card and went to town with emotion and i and, and i literally thought it and felt it into being and so you know at the end of the day you know, we're just, I believe we're just uh, holographic images through which higher powers are projecting themselves. Yeah. And I, I do believe that 100% that <clears throat> what I feed myself. But you get on to faith. You know, I believe that, you know, faith is the eternal elixir. It's what, it's what breathes life and vitality into the vibration of thought. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I agree with that too. Faith is the elixir. You know, without faith, you've got nothing. Oh, God, without faith, I wouldn't leave my room in the morning. <laughs> yeah, without faith, you, you know. I used to have faith that when I paid that guy in another country to deliver X amount of kilos somewhere, that it was going to be delivered. Otherwise, right. the guy that I'd sent there for no reason was going to come back and be pretty pissed off that he just flew to another country, waiting for something that never turned up. So I actually learned that I'd, already, I'd always had faith, but I had to have faith in positive stuff. I know, stuff, right? Stuff that I had no control over. You know, that's something that I've never discussed with, with, with somebody that I actually was in that business mm. is that I was in that business. I had so much faith. It was that like, like off the charts, like yeah. I, I earned millions before I had the millions, Yeah, <laughs> and, you know, the millions were there and you know, it, it's funny, but it's uh, as a, uh, you know, as, as life starts to, you know, it keeps expanding and you know, like life is this constant contrast and expansion. And, you know, especially being, you know, first of all, you know, it's obviously discovery leads to recovery. And, you know, I, I truly believe that, you know, the further I go in this physical world, life experience on the physical plane, so to speak, um, my desires have changed so much. It's not about accumulating, you know, things that are physical. You know, it's uh, all I really care about is actually giving back. It's, it's what makes me the most happy is when I can actually put a smile on somebody's face or, you know, laughing you know, and yeah. uh, thing out of that state of anxiety and, and fear. Like we talked about, it's like, especially when we're driven by such an overstimulated society with social media and all this kind of stuff these days. And I mean, I, I really try to use, I, I mean, I was off social media for years and now I, I was like, you know what, it, it, it is a thing. And so if I am going to like use my voice in some sort of way, if I'm going to use it, I might as well go on there and try to give a positive message with yeah. a little bit of life involved. Because at the end of the day, look, I'm trying to live my life joyous, happy, and free. I'm not. Yeah. I I didn't get sober to leave a, lead a mediocre life either. So no. I say to people, I never got clean to live in the park. Exactly. I don't apologize for having wealth. I worked my ass off. Yeah. I worked my ass off for wealth. I worked my ass off when I was a criminal. Yeah. You know? That's my nature. See, what people don't understand is the only thing I changed was I stopped taking drugs and I changed the way I thought. I changed yes. the way I acted and the way I reacted. Absolutely. And you channeled it towards something positive. Exactly. You know, that's all. Reframe it and you channel whatever you were doing before into something that's more, say, positive or negative. And, you know, it's positive or negative to people's perception. Yeah. You know, so positive for me might not be positive for you. So at the end of the day, it's all, you know, it's all a choice. And that's why we've been given, that's why we've been given free will. <laughs> yeah. And that's the truth. I was always, even when I was a criminal, I was a very determined, um, yeah. tenacious, never give in type of guy. When I was a fighter, you know, that's why I knew, it's very hard to beat me because you have to kill me. So that was my right. attitude. I have the same attitude in recovery. That's why I'm 38 years clean. Exactly. I love your attitude. Because no matter what, I'm not giving up. You yeah. know, I spent 50, over 15 years in prison, most of it in maximum security, a lot of it in solitary confinement, and they couldn't break me. They used to hate me. They used to come in there because I was also clean when I did my last eight years in prison. I was in recovery. And they'd put me in maximum, they'd put me in lockdown, and, and everyone would be kicking their doors and screaming out, and, and they'd come past and look through the people, I'd be there meditating. And the old boss used to say to me, the old governor used to say to me, does anything ever piss you off? 
I say, not really. Wow. He said, why? I said, what good is it going to do for me to get pissed off? What am I going to achieve? What am I going to gain? Exactly. I'm going to exactly. lose my peace of mind. I'm going to lose my perception. I'm going to lose my gratitude. I'm going to lose my faith. And I'm not letting yep. you take that. I'm not letting you take that off me. You've taken my freedom. You've taken my material possessions. You've taken my wife and children. You're not taking my fucking peace of mind. Okay. Well, you know what? It's funny that you say that. I, I think I learned more about life when I was in prison than outside of prison. Yeah. And I, I, 20, I had just turned 24 when I went into the maximum federal, federal penitentiary in, in down the States. And I was all depressed when I first went in there. I was supposed to be this big hockey star and everything. And next thing I know, I'm in this federal penitentiary for moving big quantities of marijuana. And, you know, I'm feeling shame and guilt. And then there's, there's this little Japanese guy that was in there. And uh, he was smuggling weed across the border in army trucks. And this guy was a, he was a and uh, he would just be so cool, calm, and collective. And I would watch him just the way he maneuvered around the prison. And we got to be really close friends. I was 24. He was 56 at the time. Yeah. And he was always tuning in and tuning out and you know and he was starting to teach me about vibration and frequencies and all this kind of stuff and meditation and visualization and before i know it i mean i was literally i, I mean i was 24 and i was running that prison with my mind and uh, my, my prison cell was like a magnet I, I was you know buddies with the crips the bloods the mexicans the bikers all these guys and uh, you know it was like, I'm just this hockey player guy in here. And uh, and I was cool, calm, and collective. As soon as I got out of prison, it, just, it, it kind of flipped. <laughs> and then, then, right. I turned, then I turned into a snap show, um, uh, manipulate an asshole again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I, I, I had the pleasure of meeting a guy that you know or know of. His name is Wayne Gretzky. Oh, no way. He wow. he got he got tattooed. We oh, my best buddy owned a tattoo studio in Sunset Boulevard called Sunset Tattoo. His name is Greg James. He yeah. tattooed he tattooed Wayne. He tattooed Wayne's wife. No, oh Janet. Okay, yeah, Janet. He put he put Janet. He put uh, Wayne's number on Janet's ass. No way. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not many people would know that. Not many people would know that she's got a got her husband's number on her ass. Exposed on this podcast that Wayne Gretzky's wife got tattooed on her bum number 99. Good thing the 90 flipped around, eh? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a true story, man. Yeah, my buddy tattooed on, on her ass. Oh god. Yeah. Uh, that's see, we we I lived in LA for a long time, you know. I was there, we tattooed, tattooed Charlie Sheen, Motley Crue, Ozzy Osbourne, David Carradine. Charlie Sheen used to hang out a lot there. He was just before he completely lost control. See, the funny part is when you were in LA, when you were locked up, I was there. I was living in LA. I was yeah. living in LA in 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. I was there all that whole time that you said, you know, the, the bud from coming from Canada. I was living in LA. Wow. But I wasn't, I wasn't committing crime that I'd retired again. I came out of retirement for a very short period of time and went back to prison, got arrested. No, I came out of retirement to help a buddy. Oh, yeah. Because, uh, yeah. I did that too, and I never went right. That's the thing. It went, I, I went years and years and never lost anything. And I thought everything was hunky dory. I never had any threats on my life. I had all the muscle behind me, and I was just so smart. And then all of a sudden, in one week, <laughs> I was extorted three times, guns to the head. Said, oh God! I mean, lie detector tests. I mean, I don't know if you ever get the chance to watch that National Geographic "Locked Up Abroad" uh, uh, what, season ten, episode eight. I mean, it's a sliver of my story. You can only. I watched it because my best buddy's on it too. Uh, he's on "Locked Up Abroad." Yeah. yeah I, I, joke, actually. I, I when I wrote across Canada for uh, mental health, uh, I was in Toronto about a week after the ride. And I get this message in my inbox, my email, and uh, they're, they're like, oh, yeah, we heard uh, Canada's, uh, one of the Canada's you know, biggest marijuana smugglers uh, is doing all this advocacy work for sex trafficking and now mental health. And uh, we'd love to have your story on uh, banged up abroad and locked up abroad, respectively. I never even heard of the show. I thought it was a joke. I thought yeah. somebody was playing on me. 
And so I was like, oh, okay, I can use this platform maybe to, maybe to give back, get the story out there. I haven't even watched the whole movie through. I lived it. And, yeah. uh, I, I, you know, I, they flew me out to London to, to do the filming. And, um, you know, I guess there was, I mean, it was, it was a big, quite a big production. And I, I sat there. I was like, I was, thir- I lost 30 plus pounds going across, uh, you know, three countries in Asia. Then two weeks after Asia, I did uh, the second largest landmass in the world. And uh, God, I, I, if, if I took a shower, I, I was lucky I didn't fall through the drain. That's how skinny I am. So in that episode, they're asking me all these questions. And I was just like, I mean, I was out to lunch half the time. And uh, I mean, I, I, it out. I, you know, I, I should have considered that the, the name of the show locked up abroad, that they were going to be really embellishing and glamorizing the drug world. Yeah. And you know, uh, my life had changed so much at that time. And I was, I was thinking, you know, maybe half the show, they would show some of the good things that I'd done in the world. <laughs> so, my, but, buddy, so, my buddy, he spent 19, 19 years in Thailand, wow. two years in America, and then two years back in Australia. And I was with him a few weeks ago, and he said it's one of his biggest regrets when he came home that he did that show because they just embellished it so badly. Uh, you know what? The one thing is, though, um, it, it opened a lot of doors, uh, especially to do the film that I, that I just uh, was yeah. that I able to shoot. Uh, you know, some of it was shot in Mexico. Some of it was shot in Vancouver. The rest was shot in Texas. And it's my true life testimony with everything that's in it. I didn't hold back one bit, you know, talking about everything that I've been through in my life. There's 16 hours of footage that's been going through, you know, right now. And it'll be put into an hour and a half. And, uh, you know, there's already discussions of part two coming out. Mm-hmm. And uh, hopefully God's plan is uh, kind of what I'm thinking. Is, uh, you know, a lot of it is centered around my daughter, her getting clean. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping that part two will be, you know, having her being a part of it. And, uh, you know, her clean and sober. And, you know, it's, I really, you know, we, we really want to turn it into a movement of, you know, connecting humanity through mental health and recovery. Because yeah. uh, the people out there that are suffering and, you know, you and I are too lucky, you know, we're blessed, you know, God must have had his hand on us the whole time because look at the stuff that we've done in our lives. I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, the law of averages, realistically, we should not be having this discussion right now. <laughs> nope. None of my friends are alive. Me neither. Me neither. I, I, I mean, I have new, I have new wonderful people in my life, but all those friends that I had back in the day, they're either dead in yep. prison we're still doing maybe the same stuff I don't, I don't talk to them i i am so far removed from that there's you you couldn't put billions and billions of dollars in front of my face to do anything even remotely like i i, I did before and i mean i had i was running it like a fortune 500 company i had mm-hmm. black cryptid in costa rica i had accountants and Oh God! And warehouses and compartments. I mean, you name it. It was. I mean, I had an uncle that was, you know, one of the biggest cocaine importers at the time. I mean, it was just. It got so out of control. My biggest problem was like, where do I hide the money? Always you is. Know? Everyone laughs when you say that. They don't believe it. People say. That. I like it when people tell me they had five million dollars in a suitcase. I say, mate, you can't carry five million dollars. No. You can't. As as they tell me I, I had five million dollars in the suitcase and I walked through the airport. I say, mate, you're a liar. Exactly. You're a liar. You can't carry five million dollars. You've never had five million dollars. You don't know what five million dollars looks like, motherfucker. Exactly. You know, I you laugh when not- people tell stories, man. They don't they don't weigh up. If you don't know what it looks like, you don't know what it looks like. I, 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 I see now I feel bad sometimes when I see these kids, younger generation trying to be a gangster, looking like a gangster with this persona. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, if they only knew. Yeah. It's not, these guys haven't seen, well, I mean, I wouldn't want them to see it. But, yeah. you know, that's one of, you know, through this, you know, this project that uh, that we just got done, we're really trying to help open the floodgates of, you know, I'd love to be able to go into prisons and speak to a lot of, you know, these guys that are, you know, you know coming out of prison and not to, you know, jump back into it like I did. And, you know, that was, I mean, two days after I got out of prison, I was full throttle back in the game again. Yeah. That I was going to get out and get into film and, uh, you know, maybe do hockey again over in Europe. But, uh, you know, old dogs uh, are hard to die. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do it in Australia at the moment, too, trying to get into the corrective services and open up a, a prop. I had a unit 
Um, yeah, you go. I, I, when I was just serving my last sentence, I had eighteen. I got sentenced to eighteen years, and I went to a prison that was a uh, privately run prison for the last three years of my sentence. And the the governor there, he believed in rehabilitation. He gave me a whole wing with twenty eight guys in it, and I ran it like a rehab. That's awesome. That is so uh, cool. The only time in history it's ever been done, and then corrective services, if they moved him out and they closed it down, of course they destroyed it because um, say so look, oh wow, this was, this was their recovery. It's an inside job. Have you been to prison yet? You're eligible yet. Yeah, you're eligible to. If not, why not? Uh, recovering addicts at the Verulam Correctional Centre invite you to Australia's first ever NA convention. This was, I had this, this was, was going to have an NA convention in prison and the GM moved and the new GM came in and said, not going to happen. You, you're manipulating the system, Ron. You're a bad guy. You know, you're a drug smuggler and you're making it, you're helping all these people. And yeah, man, we, we really kicked some ass in there. And these guys clean today because of that 12 years ago, 15 years ago, that, that rehab that I ran in prison, guys are still clean today. i got a buddy who lives in Thailand. He's a really smart guy. He's a crypto smarty ass and um he's about ready to sell his company for 200 million dollars that um was in there for using meth you know and he, and he got clean with me you know i 12 stepped him in there and he's been clean since you know but um yeah man look nothing's beyond us nothing is beyond us when we put our energy in the right direction absolutely yeah no i truly believe that thoughts become things and yeah. powerful that especially when they're mixed with definiteness of purpose you yes. know and Especially when I was out there using and abusing and, you know, even in that life of crime. Hey, I, I will say when I was living a life of crime, I did have a purpose. My purpose yeah. was doing that. I felt like I had a purpose. It just wasn't the purpose that I was meant to do or else I wouldn't be talking to you. And I wouldn't be doing, you know, I, now it's all about service. You know, first thing I do when I wake up in the morning, God, how can I be a service to you today? How can I be a service? Somehow and in some way, well, he paves the way. You know, I mean, there's, you know, I had a bit of a rough morning this morning with some stuff I've been dealing with back home. And even with this film that's uh, being, you know, put together, it's, it's not easy. You know, I, I, I'm not a Hollywood guy. I don't like Hollywood. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't do anything to try to be famous. I don't, I don't care about fame. You know, that whole thing came out with National Geographic. Oh, he's famous. This and that. No, you know, oh, he was this and that. But I don't care about that. I, I like I, I, what gives me the most fulfillment in life is being able to help another person make their life. I love seeing other people succeed. And, you know, when I see someone that, that succeed and maybe I can play a little bit into that, that just, it makes my heart sing. And, uh, you know, just, just for today. <laughs> I, I did a video yesterday, just a short clip that's going on Instagram, maybe today. And I go outside and I show a couple of cars. I've got, I, I, I'm a Corvette freak. <laughs> you like my dad then. I'm, I've got a ZR1. There's only two of them in the whole of Australia. No way. The 2019 ZR1, I've got a C8, latest model, brand new car, both sitting in my garage out the backyard. And I did well, a video. I'm not, this... I'm not too far away from Australia. Maybe I'll have to come over there for a visit and uh, bump come, into you. Come and say hello. I'm serious. My... You're quite welcome to come and say hello. I, I actually, a few years back, I was supposed to go to, uh, oh my God, that's a beauty. Oh my gosh. Is that your house? Yeah, that's my house. Yeah. Wow. See, so I don't apologize for being successful. I'm successful because I'm clean. Yeah. That's if I pick up a drink or a drug tomorrow, guess what? All that's gone. See you later. Bye. Yeah. Bye. That's the thing. It's and that quick. <laughs> so, it's only a matter of time, man. The, when the threshold is crossed, it's crossed forever. I tried going back and it just got worse every time. I mean, I didn't get it right the first time. There was actually, there was a bet in the AA rooms when I first started going in, in, into the rooms. There was me and another guy that went in there and, and it, there was a bet going on that um, my buddy would relapse and I would stay clean for good. And anyways, uh, <laughs> he ended up, he's been clean now for 21 years and I, I, I've relapsed probably five or six times. I mean, yeah. by the grace of God, I got seven and a half years without a sip of booze, but mm -hmm. I have that benzodiazepams and that's why i'm really passionate about getting that message out there because um they can actually cause a brain injury they can um at, at one point i didn't think i was going to be able to taper down to even where i'm at right now you do know that you can die on benzodiazepine withdrawals 
Absolutely. And that's why I actually... You don't die on heroin withdrawals. You don't die on ice withdrawals. You don't die on cocaine withdrawals. But you can die on a benzodiazepine which the doctor gives you freely. Yeah, because I wouldn't take antidepressants because he told me in a 15-minute little interview, this guy was 82 years old. He was a spender. He ended up going to jail about probably months after he diagnosed me for uh, molesting his clients. Mm. Uh, I told him a little bit about my life. I just gotten out of this relationship that I was devastated that we broke up and I was depression a little bit and the anxiety goes, well, I'm going to put you on lithium. You're bipolar. You're manic. And I said, well, I'm not taking antidepressants. And he goes, well, then why don't we put you on these things? They're called Xanax. And then the <laughs> next thing, Xanax started, I mean, God, talk about being dumbed down. I would, uh, you know, started with one, then I'm taking four and I'm trying to, I, I, I had no idea. I didn't know that they would, I thought they were just supposed to calm you down a little bit. I'm going well, to they calm you down. Oh, they calm you down. It's like having a big warm hug. No I mean, sex not, drive, no ambition, no, no drive, no completion, yeah, no emotion. Fucking great drug. Great drug. Total apathy. No, yeah. yeah. Oh, how do you control this guy? Let's put him on Xanax. Exactly. Cut him off to source completely. Liquid lobotomy, I call him. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, actually, I got a personal apology from my other psychiatrist that I'd been seeing, I haven't seen him in quite some time. And I, cause I, I, I lost it on when, over the past few years. So much education has come up about with these benzos about how bad they are for you. And uh, I was like, how the heck did you keep prescribing me these things? And he's like, I am so sorry. I I'm sorry. I'm like, sorry, God. I mean, it's for, for it's been nine some odd years now that I've been on these things, you know, off and on them. And because coming off them, I mean, you feel unwell. Like yeah. it's, it's, it's a brutal. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, I'm actually working with a doctor back home in Canada right now. And, you know, this time we're actually, we've been tapering correctly. And I'm not ashamed to admit it. I mean, if, if, if I don't tell the truth and be completely open and honest about this, then it doesn't open the doorway for other people to, you know, do the same thing. So, um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's like alcohol and drugs weren't my problem. I was my problem. Exactly. You know, I couldn't fix me. I couldn't do it. I had to, I, I had to, I had to find uh, something greater than me that was going to, you know, fill the void because it was, uh, the void was so, <laughs> it was pretty big. To me, the thing that's greater than me is love. Of absolutely. My high yeah. power is love, understanding and forgiveness. 100%. You That's know what, you you have a radical forgiveness story. After yeah. talking about your story and everything like that, God, maybe we get, we'll get, maybe we'll get you in part three. Yeah. <laughs> your, your, is your book out? Have you written a book? I'm actually working on a new book. Uh, okay. I wrote it before, but I actually, uh, I'm no longer with that agent or publishing company, so I actually pulled it off uh, Amazon. Yeah, it did cool. quite um, And I just, uh, things didn't work out. It was, uh, I'm I'm Canadian. I signed the contract with a with an American uh, publishing company, and um, you know what? There's a whole different chapter that's being written right now of my life. You know, we're living in completely different times. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, I think it it served its purpose when it came out, but uh, you know, I don't promote that book. It's nothing really. Oh, uh, cool. I knew uh, I know I can write a book. That's great. You know, yeah. but at the end, of the day, my passion isn't writing. I, I love to speak to kids. I like to help people that are in recovery. Yeah. And I like to, uh, even though I'm not a cyclist, apparently I like to bike across countries for uh, uh, causes. <laughs> yeah, well, mate, it's a threefold disease. Physical, mental, and spiritual. The physical 100%. part is once you start, you can't stop. The mental part is once you start thinking about it, you'll cause a compulsion which makes you pick up. The spiritual part is the total self centeredness And you've got to treat all three of them. I'm 70 exactly. years of age in, in a few months. I still train. I still ride a bike. I laugh when you say a bike. I got a shed full of bikes up there, you know. And I got a stationary bike. I ride because I, I don't trust the people on the street anymore where I live. I live out in this rurally sort of area. They run over you. They're idiots. Yeah. But um, you know, I still believe you've got to be physically well. You've got to be mentally well. But you've got to be spiritually well. Spiritually well is being of service to others. Yes. Open, honest, being service to others, yeah. and when you're being I was, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, things aren't working well with my spiritual life. I mean, well, what have you done to help with somebody today? Get up 
outside of yourself. Try to help somebody. Do something for somebody. That's it. It's that so those simple. things there, they're called the eight demands. They're my, they're my principles to recovery. Now, I'll read them to you quickly. The eight demands. Openness, to stay where you stand, but don't stand your ground. Be open to your thoughts and your feelings. Acceptance, accept that other people can see you better than you can see yourself. Reliability, be reliable with your thoughts and your feelings. If you say you're going to do something, do it. If you say you're not going to do it, don't do it. Consistency, start your day at five mile an hour, finish it at five mile an hour. Thoroughness, do it completely. If you clean the room thoroughly, you start at the ceiling. No shortcuts. Congruence, what I say is what I do. Don't ask somebody to do something you're not prepared to do yourself. Respect, and giving respect, we receive respect. Respect has to be earned. It can't be demanded like I thought it was. Honesty, <laughs> being honest with your thoughts and your feelings. Honesty doesn't mean leaving bits out so you don't so you're not fear of judgment. And don't add bits of on bits on so you get accepted. And at the bottom, I've got action. I act on these demands one hundred percent to the best of my ability. I'll give my wife to email you a copy of that. Oh yeah, you know I would love one of those. If yeah. you could, actually, you should copy. You, you did you you came up with that? Yeah. That, that's an. I would love a, a copy of that. That is mm -hmm. so, that is incredible. And I want to. I would like to laminate it and do the yeah, exact. Yes, mine is mine's laminated, and I give this to all my clients, and they and they've got to put it beside their bed or beside their mirror, and every day they've got to text me five things they're grateful for, and what demand they're working on today. Mm. That's the morning program. When people wake up, I make them do five breaths. Not make them. I I suggest strongly. You wake up, you get out of bed, you put your hands on your knees, you take five breaths, so you ground yourself. Write down five things you're grateful for and text them to me. Read the demands. Tell me which demands you're working on today, the one that you were lacking with yesterday. If you were closed-minded yesterday, I want you to work on openness. If you were disrespectful yesterday, I want you to work on respect. And that's my, that, that's my daily program. I know this is a podcast. Uh, is it okay if uh, maybe uh, we could uh, you could hold me accountable? We could do so, We could do some of this together? Yeah, I man. Could really, I could really use this in my life right now. Seriously. Yeah. We will we'll, we'll talk about it right off off the program. I'll give you some details. You can contact me. Um, yeah. I, every, I, I, we'll talk about it when we finish. But yeah, man. That. Yeah, no. I'd be, I'd love to help you do some work with that stuff. But um, man, look, there's so much more we could talk about. We're running out of time because right, after an hour, people lose interest in podcasts and they stop listening. Um, they actually stop listening after 20 minutes most of the time. <laughs> they do. We we do the stats on all the podcasts. This is, I think, this is my hundred and hundred and eighth podcast. Oh, nice. That I've run. So you know, I do this because I love doing it. It costs me money. I'm not sponsored. Yep. It comes out of my own pocket. It takes out our time. My wife edits it, and you know, we do everything ourselves. And then we pay a company to put them on. So it comes out of our pocket. But you know what? If we can help one person, yes, that's what I always say. Just person. That's it. Just one person through this. And you know what? And 100%, I guarantee you, with utmost, my utmost humility, we've helped at least one person today. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. yeah. And you know, actually, you've helped me. This you've is the beginning me. of a great adventure, Ryan. I'm sure you and I will do a lot more together in the future. I love that. Um, you know, man, look, we'll close this down and we'll have a chat about your own recovery. Thanks, brother. Yeah. The truth about addiction, thank you very much for coming on. So much. I know I can learn a lot, of, a lot from you. Appreciate it. I solemnly swear that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God.